Greetings, class. I just uh, wanted to say a few words about the 18th century novel uh, in a kind of see-my-face format, so it feels a little bit more like a class and that we're actually interacting uh, beyond just sending email messages to each other and things like that. So um, uh, I am your teacher. I exist. And um, uh, let's just, I'll say a few things about the 18th century novel, uh, give some reasons for its kind of sudden rise, and then we'll talk more specifically about Daniel Defoe, Mel Flanders, Richardson, Pamela, and um, the reading for the, for the class. Thank you very much. So um, if we want to look at reasons for the rise of the novel, there are many, and scholars have kind of debated and discussed those reasons. Um, but one of the main reasons that they look at is the kind of fall in popularity and status of uh, drama, which if you think about, you know, the, the age of Shakespeare in the prior century or two before the 18th century um, was kind of when drama was king in the literary world. Um, but if you think about it a little bit more, you kind of remember or remind yourself historically that drama had a little bit of trouble in the uh, 17th century specifically, uh, in the mid to late 17th century, after having an enormous uh, importance and popularity in English culture in the early part of the 17th century and the late part of the 16th century. So if you kind of wonder what happened in the middle of the 17th century, so the 1650s, thereabouts and beyond, that um, put an end to the playhouses, um, first of all, the theater was made illegal, uh, so after the, uh, after Oliver Cromwell came to power, uh, the Puritans kind of said, no more plays. I think that lasted for about 18 years. And uh, so writers had to look for other modes of expression. The other thing is simply that, um, you know, again, theater being kind of a public, uh, performative public form of literature and literary expression... Um, you'll, in the day and age of COVID and the pandemic and the shutdowns, you'll, uh, kind of, this will ring a bell, um, that there was a plague in the 1660s, I think it was 1665, 1666, anyway, it was the plague year, and, uh, Daniel Defoe, who wrote Mal Flanders, actually wrote, famously, a journal of the plague year, even though it was much later that he wrote that, but he wrote... Uh, a journal from 18, or sorry, 1665-66, um, describing in detail the horrors of life in London during the plague year, during that year, where things were shut down and people were kind of forced to quarantine in their homes. I think they left like an, an X or a red X, like, you know, this place is condemned or quarantined, you can't go in here, it's boarded up. Um yeah, it was a horrible time. People were going crazy because everyone was dying. So my understanding is that um, the plays kind of took a hit at that time as well, uh, because the plays were once again, the theater was once again um, closed. So the public forum of theater was subject to closure and subject to plague. And it's funny that the form of a novel, it kind of seems a little bit more like uh, when you were told to work from home during the pandemic shutdown. Uh, a novel is something you can both read, write, and enjoy in the comfort of your own home, uh, just like a Zoom call with your tablet. You don't have to go anywhere to enjoy a novel, unlike a play. Uh, so, I mean unlike a 17th century play where you had to go, actually go to the playhouse. So, in other words, you, you can see that maybe that gave writers a little bit of peace of mind, like, oh, here's a, here's a format that is widely available that won't get shut down. Uh, the wide availability of the novel was also 
contingent upon the new middle class. The uh, there's you know with the big first beginnings of the industrial revolution in the 18th century, um, there were more kind of educated people, uh, wider the middle class people with a little bit of spending money. Uh, they could afford a little bit of literature to satisfy their leisure hours. And uh, so this gave kind of a newly literate public some reading material. And so I know I said that about the 19th century, for those of you who, had, who have had me before, that there was a wider audience because people there were more people with money. and But a, on a smaller scale, that was going on in the 18th century as well. So... So that's kind of the, that's one explanation for the rise of the, the novel. Another one could be, another one is, um, you know, not just the, the actual material, the materiality of the novel. This is a book that you can hold in your hand and read at home if you're literate. Um, but the, the mode of literary communication in a novel is quite different then some other forms that, like, and I'll bring up Bunyan. Um, that's a form that's an allegory, and it deals with someone with a very clear uh, kind of spiritual path. And the things that happen um, to the pilgrim are all usually, you know, things to avoid. But it's not that these things shape him so much is that they they're just things that he has to endure and get through because the singleness of purpose of Paul Bunyan is of John Bunyan sorry not Paul Bunyan the singleness of purpose in John Bunyan is to you know rejoin God or whatever to be on that pilgrimage uh, the pilgrimage for God and not to be like not to be distracted or, or sucked into temptations by the slough of despond and all these other kind of things that tempt. The trick is to cut them off, slough them off of your body and continue on without being touched by those kinds of experiences. Now, the novel, the novel proper rather than the allegory, uh, that arises in the 18th century by Defoe and uh, Richardson and others is more connected to kind of the picaresque Spanish novel. The, the traveler kind of, or the, the main character, goes through a series of adventures and has a series of missteps. Sometimes he's quite roguish, as in the case of Moll Flanders. So Moll Flanders could be called a picaresque no novel. So she has adventures, and these adventures actually touch her in, in the sense that these experiences build upon her character. They influence her and she is, it's not that she's always like, no, I don't want that experience. Like in Bunyan, he's kind of like always tries to keep experience at arm's length because he has the singleness of purpose of getting beyond those experiences. In Mal Flanders, these are, you know, she's has lust for life. She has lust for men. She, you know, she wants to embrace a full life of experience. Clearly, she, you know, being unpassionate about her life is not one of her, her faults. She's, she, like, lives with gusto and passion, even when she gets herself into trouble. So she embraces experience. Now, not to get philosophical, but I think actually the embrace of experience can be perhaps tied to the rise of someone like Locke, like the philosopher John Locke. And that's not an accidental connection. Because um, Defoe was a big fan of Locke, and many of Locke's, many of Locke's uh, kind of the main tenets of his philosophy were adopted by Defoe. Now, when we think of John Locke, we usually think of him as a political philosopher. You know, it's kind of one of the fathers of the American Revolution in a philosophical sense, the de uh, denial of the divine right of kings and popular sovereignty and all these things. Um, well, uh, Daniel Defoe, did I ever say Willem Defoe? I hope I didn't. <laughs> Daniel Defoe was, um, was a big fan of Locke and he was a, 
a kind of a a critic of mo the monarchy and the divine right of kings. And he wrote actually a lot of pamphlets, most of his early writing. I think he didn't start writing actual novels till he, till he was in his 50s. So where was I going with this? Oh, right. So, <clears throat> so when we think of Locke, we usually think of him as a political philosopher. Well, he's not just a political philosopher. He... Uh, his epistemological uh, writings deal with the idea that we are kind of the sum of our um, of our experience, that we are born a tabula rasa, and experience imprints things onto our soul or, or on our psyche or on our being, and we become a a we are molded by our experience, and I think that kind of that zest for experience, uh, the description of ver various experiences and sensory, sensory detail that we get in novels. It's very Lockean, and uh, it kind of is a testament to Locke's influence on those early novelists that you get in, in Def Defoe, Defoe's early novels, where experience and its ability to mold someone uh, in it with its you know wide display of, of sensory stimulus is is gets the focus whereas prior to that ex prior to the the real novel that we think of when we think of novels you get something a little bit more like a religious text where experience you don't really grow from experience again like experience is something the experience is to be held at arm's length because Usually experience is uh, where you get temptation and the devil, and the whole trick is to rise above all that. Um, so um, there's a bit of a, more of a celebration of, of these kind of, uh, of experiences. Now, this is not to say that all these experiences are wonderful, and of course, within this reverence for experiential, sensual uh, life that you get in Defoe, there is also a political, uh, a political message that uh, we have. Uh, you know, it's a little bit like the right to liberty and the pursuit of happiness um, that you get in Locke uh, is something that uh, Defoe seems to be implying in almost a Dickensian way, like to look at these poor people who, through no fault of their own, many times, um, now that could be argued, but for the most part, I think at the beginning especially, we mostly are very sympathetic to Maul, and um, she, most of her misfortunes are not of her own doing. Um, and of course, like, but I think he's also interested in the human condition in the sense that um, even when she becomes a thief, even when she, you know, abandons her children or, I mean, that's actually the one thing that I, I don't like about Maul is she seems very cavalier about, well, sometimes, again, even that, like sometimes she takes very good care of, at least taking care of her kids through by proxies, but um, anyway, but even when she becomes a very hardcore criminal thief, uh, even if we condemn her for that, I think most of us can at least see why she goes there through necessity at first. And then we see once you become, once you kind of paint yourself with that brush, you st you taint yourself with that stigma of like i'm a thief you you become proud of it and i think that's a very human um i think that's a very human uh tendency um and i do have some strengths and not all my strengths are necessarily looked on by society as positively valued strengths but their strengths nonetheless. I am a good thief. <laughs> and uh, and she embraces that. 
um, we look for we look for excellence in strange places sometimes, and we become proud of our we we become proud of our uh, our failures. I don't know. It's strange. Like it reminds me of people who. I don't know, like the abused spouse who, who's like, there, I don't know, there's a bit of Stockholm Syndrome going on where she knows it's wrong, but she becomes quite prideful of her, her abilities so much that she doesn't abandon them even when, even when there is no longer necessity to do that. So she has 500 pounds tucked away, but she continues to, to go on these she continues to go on these um forays into london and to uh, lift purses and stuff so you can see that defoe kind of concerns himself with the inner workings of the like human psychology more so than kind of preaching or moralizing articulating that which is rather than that which ought to be. And actually, Moll Flanders herself kind of echoes this realism when she says things like, I'm giving an account of what was, not of what ought or ought not to be. And speaking more to the psychologization of uh, Defoe's characters and how, they, how they're influenced by their experience, you can see that... <clears throat> Maul is, um, not only does she uh, exhibit some of these own qualities herself, but she sees them in others, where once you kind of get involved in a habit or a bad habit or vice, that it becomes easier to fall into it again. Um, it becomes routine. It becomes, um, you know, an addiction of sorts. Another quote to illustrate that would be something like, uh, where she's talking about her experience as a basically as a prostitute to the uh, baron that she meets. And she kind of explains away the fact that he continued to see her by saying, the crime once is a sad handle to the committing of it again, whereas all the regret and reflection wear off when the temptation renews itself. 